Greetings and welcome. Here we are at Aloud. Thank you so much for coming tonight for a conversation with Janusz Varoufakis and Alex Cohen. I'm Louise Steinman, the program director for the Library Foundation and thrilled to see you here tonight. Many of here, you are here for the upteenth time, some of you for the first time, but just in case you don't know the process, we'll have the conversation and then we will take some questions from the audience. We will um, circulate microphones as we record for podcast and afterwards, uh, Janis Varoufakis will be signing his books in the lobby courtesy of our library store. Janis Varoufakis achieved Europe-wide celebrity in 2015 when he attempted to renegotiate Greece's debt to the European Union as Greece's finance minister during a financial crisis that paralyzed his country. He says they're now in the 10th year of that depression. He currently coordinates a pan-European political movement, DM25, which favors among its policies a green investment program and generosity to refugees. Varoufakis studied economics in the UK, first at the University of Essex and mathematical statistics at the University of Birmingham. He has a PhD in economics and teaches economic theory at the University of Athens. His trilogy of books about the financial crisis, The Global Minotaur and The Weeks Suffer What They Must, and Adults in the Room, which he spoke about this afternoon, along with his latest book to be released in English, which he'll discuss tonight with radio host Alex Cohen, talking to my daughter about the economy, all advance his vision of a more democratic international system. Talking to my daughter about the economy is his attempt to explain economics to his 13 actually now 14-year-old daughter, and was finally a book on economics. I could follow. This was really thrilling. It's a great book. And one of the sections I, I loved uh, was when Giannis explains to his daughter quite movingly about, quote, the unstoppable victory of market values over experiential values. And those are the experiences, he says, that we do simply because they feel right, not because they have a monetary value but because they feel right. They feel like it makes us part of a community, which really made me think about this great library and how we're here tonight to listen, um, to join each other as citizens in a spirit of inquiry and, and how different that is from ordering a book on Amazon with a, a click. So here's, here's it for the library. <laughs> and then one more personal commentary and I'll let you on to Giannis, but before I sat down to reading his book yesterday, I was reading uh, in the morning LA Times, and this phrase from Steve Lopez's column about our own city jumped out at me. Quote, the homeless are a prophetic presence, a symbol of breakdowns on so many levels, widespread poverty in a land of riches, unaffordable housing, substandard health care, limited psychiatric services and facilities. All of that has taken a toll, and so have the brigades of scarred, bomb-rattled veterans returning from distant wars out of one tent and into another. To solve problems like these, Yanis Varoufakis reminds us, quote, we all need to be able to talk authoritatively about the economy. It's a prerequisite, he says, for a good society and a precondition for an authentic democracy. And I think talking to my daughter about the economy is a great place to start. I love this book, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Alex Cohen, as you know, is the local host of Morning Edition. We're always delighted to welcome Alex back. Prior to that, she was the co-host of KPCC's Take Two. She also has a young daughter to whom she can talk to about the economy and as well a very new son. Uh, please wel welcome Alex Cohen and Giannis Varifox. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm very excited to have this chat. As Louise just mentioned, I do have a daughter to whom I try to talk about the economy as best as I can. This book was a great help. Um, and I do have a very new son. He just turned two months old yesterday. Thank you. Uh, and it's very interesting. It's, it's exciting to have a new child. But bringing a new child into this world at this time 
uh, is troubling. It's vexing in a lot of ways. And I have to say, reading this book uh, gave me a lot more hope and a lot more to think about. Uh, and it really is. It's a personal book. It is a conversation that Giannis has with his daughter. So I kept trying to picture. I pictured this very lively, vivacious uh, girl. Can you tell us a little bit about your daughter, Exenia, and especially what she was like? How old was she when you first started writing this, what she was like at the time? Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you to this splendid institution. Okay, my daughter, my worst critic, uh, the person who is uh, constantly dismissing what I say bec before I've said it. Uh, she was around 11. Um, she's highly politicized without knowing it and without acknowledging it. You know how young people are. They have very strong views about climate change, about um, inequality, injustice, about racism, about uh, um, sexual politics. She came back to me once and she lectured me on uh, what gender neutrality meant, which I didn't know, I have to confess. <laughs> uh, uh, but if, if you start talking to her uh, in the way that the adults who have been in, in indoctrinated and infected by the language of the establishment, she immediately switches off. And I think that is a good thing. So the reason why I wrote this book, uh, and I had these, well, the reason why I wrote it was because I wanted to organize my own thinking about the economy. I'm an economist, so I'm, I have to deprogram myself in order to start understanding the economy. The first thing you need to do as an economist in order to understand the economy is forget everything you've been taught at university and everything you've ever taught students at university. Uh, and the best way of doing that is when you have a recalcitrant 11-year-old daughter wi who is ever ready to dismiss everything you say, imagining how you can make her interested in the economy and how you can explain it in such a way as to prevent the switching off moment uh, is, is, is a great device as an author for sitting down and writing a book like that. And I want to follow up on what you were just saying about uh, the scientific models of the economy that are out there. I'm sure in this library there is probably an entire wing filled with books with various theories that this is how the economy works. And you say that those, th th that they don't really reflect the true economy. Why is that? Let me start by an observation, a fact. Uh, the economy is a very new idea. 200 years ago, nobody spoke about the economy. It did not exist as a concept. People talked about society. They talked about their country, their land, their community. But no one ever spoke about There was no economics. Huh? The great universities did not have economics departments. The first economics departments emerged uh, in very few places in the end of the 19th century, um, in most universities, well into the 20th century. So. Why is that? Because something remarkable happened uh, towards the end of the 18th century, beginning with Britain and Amsterdam, and then spread in the 19th century and took off in the second part or the latter, latter part of the 19th century with industrialization, capitalism. So c before capitalism, all sources of power were intertwined. They were one thing. So if you wanted to understand why a ruler, a baron, a lord had power, you had to understand the size of his army, and the size of his realm. You had to understand the kind of control he had over his uh, minions, uh, over the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, um, the various um, earls that he controlled, who in turn controlled peasantry that belonged to the land that they owned collectively. Um, and if you wanted, for instance, to explain why Spain invaded Central America and Latin America, you don't need an economic narrative. You need a historical narrative, a political narrative, a, a scientific narrative to explain how they developed the art of navigating the seas and shipbuilding and all that. But if you want to explain why Japanese, the Japanese car industry destroyed, de uh, destroyed Detroit, um, it doesn't help to look at it from a military perspective 
from the perspective of politics. You need something different. You need an economic narrative. So that's a long-winded answer to say that um, in order to come to terms with the economy, you have to come to terms with capitalism. Now, capitalism is a very dynamic system. It constantly changes its colors. It adapts. It, um, for those of you who, who are Trekkies like me, you know, Star Trek fans, you will remember the Borg, yeah? Uh, resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. That's capitalism. The, the, when, the, when the moment market penetrates through commodification into certain realms of life, whether this is the ag agriculture, universities, uh, hospitals, uh, yeah, genetics, suddenly it the market me mechanism assimilates everything and turns qualities into quantities. I'm not being critical, I'm simply describing. So things that had value that could not be measured, like a beautiful sunset or the relationship between members of a community suddenly acquired a price. And as Oscar Wilde said, uh, a, c a cynic is he who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, but we are all becoming cynics uh, with the process of commodification. Now, the moment you have this switch from qualities to quantities, it is natural, is it not, to try to mathematize it, because mathematics is very well suited to understanding the relationship between different quantities. Uh, that a system of equations in two unknowns, x and y. Uh, x and y are two different quantities, two different variables, and you have a system of equations that tells you how they are related. So it is natural in a society that becomes commodified, that shifts from pre-capitalism to capitalism, for our uh, mind to try to understand this Im immense change, which was also very traumatic. The um, evolution of capitalism in, Br in Britain in the 18th and 19th century led to the eviction of 70% of the population from their common land. So it was a very dramatic thing. The first factories were cesspools and cesspits of misery. So there was a need to understand that. So economics emerged as this attempt to understand it, to quantify it, and to mathematize it. And this was at a time when science was all the rage, for good reason, because scientists and engineers were changing the world. They changed our understanding of the world. They created el electromagnetism. We can you know, meet at night and we have lights, and we have microphones, and we send uh, satellites to space so that we know exactly through GPS. It's amazing what science has done. Uh, so in the same way that the scientific endeavor ba was based on mathematics and liberated us from superstition, from, from darkness, from all sorts of impediments that we were facing as a species, it was natural to think that we can do the same thing with society. And that in the same way that physics is the queen of the natural sciences, economics can be the queen or the king or whatever of um, the social sciences. The problem is that, and I'm trying to explain this to my daughter in the book, the problem is that even though the mathematics looks the same, whether you apply it to the macroeconomy and you, or to financial economics or to physics, nature, meteorology. The mathematics is the same, and it's beautiful, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. You know, the, the it has an enormous amount of uh, discursive power and imaginad imaginary power. Think about it. The mom it's mathematics is not easy. So you struggle with it. When you prove your first theorem, whether it's a small theorem or you, you, you reprove an existing theorem, like Pythagoras' theorem, and you actually work out the proof, you feel empowered. You feel by God, this is astonishing. This is, you know, this is, uh, as you, our children grow up, and this is what I, how I try to excite my daughter regarding mathematics. I, I fail constantly, but I try. Uh, the moment you prove Pythagoras' theorem, or any kind of theorem, suddenly you have encountered pure truth. It's not a matter of opinion. If you have a triangle, a rectangular like triangle, and you take the two sides next to the rectangle, uh, to the rectangular angle, um, and you square them, you g and you sum, add them up, you get the square of the other um, sides. And that is not a matter of, a matter of opinion. And it is the same on Mars, on the other side of the universe, on Earth. It's fantastic. 
the power of mathematics. So the idea that you're going to use this amazing logical tool to understand interest rates and employment and unemployment and inflation and wealth and the distribution of things is very strong. The tragedy is that it can't be done. Or it can be done under so restrictive conditions, to put it simply, to solve the mathematics, if you're going to have a model of the economy, you need one equation for every variable, right? Just like if you have x and y, to solve the, for x and y, you need to have two equations and two unknowns. Right? You remember that from high school or middle school or wherever. Uh, so if you have 20 unknowns, you know, the price of oil, the rate of interest, un unemployment and so on, you need 20 equations. So you need a very large system of equations. Now the problem with these systems of equations is they cannot be solved. Uh, mathematically they cannot be solved. Unless you introduce very rigid assumptions. Right? Allow me to say that the only way that economists can solve their models is by assuming away time and space. If you introduce a speck of time in, these, in the mathematics, they, there is no solution. So all the economics that students are, are taught at college, economics 101, are predicated upon the assumption that there is no such thing as time, which is very difficult for a student, even for a teacher, to wrap their minds around. Mm. So they keep lying to themselves. So permit me to explain this just a little bit more. I know I'm, this is too long an answer, but you see, the, you see why my daughter doesn't like me? <laughs> um, and at, at this stage, she would have walked off. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> Let me not keep you, Dad. Time to let you go. Uh, so, but l the point is, uh, th does any one of you remember, if you've done economics on one, the so-called demand curve? It's a line that goes slopes downwards, and the, the vertical axis is the price, l let's say, of coffee, and the horizontal axis is the quantity of coffee that people buy given that price. So as the price comes down, people want more coffee. Right? It becomes just cheaper. That's the demand curve. So the argument there is, you see, I when price comes down, People buy more coffee, and this is how much more they buy. Well, that doesn't work. Because when is a word that contains time. It implies that you had a price, you know, $2, and then it went down to 150 Then it went down to one. That, that implies time. You cannot do it. Because if you do it, if you introduce time to this model, the demand curve disappears. You cannot define it mathematically. So what we need to, to say to be correct as teachers of economics is, if price were two, then quantity would be this. But if price were something else, while nothing else changed, there was no time, then quant Okay, you can say that, but it's meaningless to a young person in reality. It is like saying, imagine a universe without time. It looks like a snapshot of a universe. Now, imagine a different universe, again without time, with different prices, it would look like this. But there is no way you can go from one snapshot to another. It's like having two snapshots but no video of what happens in between. And you can never have, we can prove mathematically that it is impossible to fill in the two snapshots with a video. In other words, we can never say anything sensible about really existing capitalism. So you have whole departments of economics, whole careers built upon uh, a model which is extremely beautiful aesthetically pleasing, mathematically complicated, and utterly useless. But it's not useless in terms of discursive power. Because if you get convinced by economists that economics is too hard for you, and it is too hard, because the mathematics is too, so complex, and you say, okay, well, in the same way, I'm not going to try to build a bridge. I'm going to defer to the engineer to build it, which is a sensible thing to do. Because if we try to build the bridge democratically, it will it, be, it will be criminal because it will kill a lot of people. Yeah, uh, If we adopt this same mindset for economics, uh, then we have to say, okay, well, we leave it to the experts. But there are now no experts. First, there are no experts in economics. There are experts in the models of economics which are irrelevant to the economy. That's why this is one of the book about economics, the book, uh, book about the economy, big difference. And secondly, if we accept the view that there are ex experts who will make all these decisions for us, given that commodification, the economy, has penetrated every nook and every cranny of our lives, effectively we were deferring all decisions to some um, 
group of so-called experts, technocrats, oligarchs, call them whatever you want. It's the end of democracy. Well, then let's just go. I mean, you know, <laughs> no. and obviously that's not the case, right? I mean, there, there may be no way that you can have these perfect scientific models, but the one aspect in which time can be relevant is we do know history and we know how we got to this point. And one of the things that I think is so successful about this book in terms of explaining the economy to your daughter or anyone regardless of age is that y you do what, what kids do, which is they ask why. And then you give an answer and then they ask why did that happen and why did that happen and why did that happen. And you follow the thread in this book all the way to about 12,000 years ago and explain how much of what we have and see and understand about the economy today has to do with the fact that human beings were very, very hungry. Can you explain? Absolutely. The, there were two major revolutions, economic revolutions in the history of humanity. One is the agricultural revolution, when we started growing stuff instead of simply gathering and hunting. Big, you know, change in the way we organize life and greater change in terms of the impact we've had on the land, on nature, on our communities. Uh, think about it, I mean, it was quite astonishing. The, the moment we created a warehouse and we stored wheat and biomass in it, we created germs that never existed before. We, we, we just changed society and the environment. So agricultural revolution was huge. And the second one was, of course, the industrial revolution. Of course, now we, our generation likes to think that the digital revolution and artificial intelligence is just as uh, significant. It's too early to know. I don't think it is as significant as the re invention of electricity and of the factory. I think that was huge at that time. Maybe holography is going to be uh, the third industrial revolution or... Uh, but uh, anyway, we, th that's for the next generation to decide. Uh, so how did these revolutions happen? Through necessity. In the case of agriculture um, techniques, uh, it is quite clear from all the evidence that it only emerged where there was absolute an absolute need to emerge. People did not suddenly think, oh, let's see how we can grow stuff. If they lived in an environment of abundance where nature provided for them, they tried to avoid um, cultivating the land as much as they could. And indeed, it was only famine that led them through the capacity of human reasoning to empirically deduce from the fact that where the tribes used to defecate, uh, I hope you forgive this reference, uh, things grew more because there were seeds that were going through their system and the fer fertilization. And so they realized they had an impact on growth and therefore they could actually try to manipulate it. And that's how agriculture began. But that only happened when they were hungry, when they, there was no apple tree nearby from which they could just get an apple and eat it and just sit, sit back. And so the, my daughter lives in, 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 in Australia and she goes to uh, a very progressive, good public school. At, at least she did back then a, pri a fantastic primary school where all the teachers were so politically correct and uh, no, I'm saying this in, in a good way, not in a bad way. Uh, and they took good care of um, you know the mental balance of the children and of their historical uh, prowess. Uh, um, they they were very reverential to the Aborigines that had been decimated by the the British and the Europeans uh, and taught them about drink time, about the splendid culture for the aborigines in Australia and so on. And I upset my daughter really badly one day when I said, okay, but can you explain to me why it was the aborigines that were invaded by the British and not the British by the aborigines? Were the aborigines nicer people who didn't want to invade others because of their DNA? Because this is a racist uh, explanation. Um, uh, were the British smarter who and therefore developed uh, sh shipping skills and navigation skills and the technologies that allowed them to create cannons and and knives and all that. So that got her. And we started having a conversation about the way in which the evolution of agriculture in 
in conjunction with the geographical and climatical uh, distribution of patterns around the world, caused the agricultural revolution to be in Eurasia and not in Australia, because in Australia they didn't need it. The Aborigines were having a, the only need, one of the things that the, the first Europeans to arrive in Australia that they noticed, and they were actually quite jealous, was that these people don't have to work. They only had to do hunting and gathering for an hour or two a day, and the rest of the time they gathered around, they had brilliant musical seances and storytelling uh, moments, and, and, uh, and they were having the good life. So agriculture is the result of famine caused by the expansion of humanity um, in numbers, and of course the human capacity for rationality and empiricism, which led to the dev development of techniques that allowed us to create an economic surplus. The moment we created an economic surplus, we changed humanity. Suddenly we, we became civilized, which also meant extremely uncivilized at the very same time, because it was only the surplus that allowed us to have armies, not just hammers, but also guns, uh, not just uh, food to feed our children, but also germs by which to destroy n the non-farming communities nearby. All we had to do was to visit them, carrying all the germs that were created by our own livestock and our own wheat, um, and so on and so forth. I want to go back to one of the things you mentioned there, because I was fascinated by this and had never really thought about the world in this way. You mentioned geography and how the orientation of certain continents and weather kind of all combined together to determine who was conquering whom. Can you drill down a little bit more on that? Because I found it really fascinating way to look so at the world. So, for instance, my, my, my daughter was saying to me, so why was Africa always treated so badly? Why didn't Africa produce an empire, whereas Europe did? People say that the blacks were not clever enough. You know, this is some what she heard some white supremacist say on the, uh, on the radio. Pauline Hanson, in particular, very nasty politician in, uh, in Australia, neo-Nazi. Uh, and, of course, the answer is that if you look at the map, Africa is long and narrow and spans many, many different climatic regions, whereas Eurasia is long and wide, and it doesn't. So when you ha when the, the agricultural revolution took place spontaneously in different parts of the, of the world, more or less at the same time, because huma human minds produce similar uh, solutions independently in different parts of the world, given similar problems. So we had an agricultural revolution in, in Central America, in China, in Africa. F the first one was in Africa, but it also happened spontaneously and autonomously in other parts, and Mesopotamia, of course, the ravaged area, today ravaged, between the Tigris and the Euphrates, I Iraq or Syria in modern day terms. Uh, but the moment you introduce, let's say, you start cultivating the land and you produce wheat in Babylonia, in Mesopotamia, it's really very straightforward for this technology to be shifted eastwards and westwards towards modern-day Turkey, and then through the Dardanelles across northern Greece, today's northern Greece, all the way to Europe, because the climate doesn't change that much. You're moving horizontally, yeah? laterally. But if you develop agricultural techniques in modern-day Zimbabwe, it doesn't travel north, because you have to go through very different climates. Uh, tropical forests where you can't grow wheat, uh, at not, not, not without destroying them, <laughs> like the way we are doing today. But back then, it, it just was I absolutely impossible to make it grow. Then you had to go through the Sahara. So you could not create an empire gradually through this imperialistic spread of your... You see, the armies need to be fed, so they need agriculture. When I I it's interesting that in, in if you read the, the, the Iliad, Homer's great poem, uh, the first thing that the Greeks did when they... Um, uh, rich Troy was to plant, to plant the, uh, and cultivate the land because they were hungry. But if you can't do it, if you, if you go north in Africa, then you cannot create an empire and you cannot invade Europe. So, th th you know, when I was telling my daughter that, suddenly she said, oh, that makes sense. And therefore, she's, she felt extremely empowered to um, confront the racists who were arguing that the problem was that these were black people. 
there's so many of those kind of wonderful light bulb aha moments where you just think, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. And, and one of the other ones that I was really fascinated by, especially in this day and age where we are living in a world of Bitcoin and Venmo and money that isn't really money that you never see or touch. And I think we tend to think of that as being a very modern 21st century notion, but that's not the case at all. This is actually where we began. Can you talk a little bit about that and mm -hmm. how it, it impacts your feelings and thoughts about the currencies we're seeing today? Absolutely. The, I mean, this is fascinating, isn't it? it? It helps to be Greek in a way, allow me to say, even though I don't want to, be, to, to sound at all um, um, you know, jingoistic about this. No, it's only the language. It's got nothing to do with DNA. The, the 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 Greek word for coin is nomisma, and it, nomisma, the word for coin, uh, you may have heard of numismatic museums. It's this word, it comes from. It has two meanings. Ancient Greek words had many meanings. Uh, one meaning is the law. Nomos is the law. And the other meaning is from the verb to think, to imagine. So, and if you read Aristotle, who speaks about coinage, about money, he was so spot on when he said that money has value if the law says that it does and if we think that it does. So it's all in our imagination. You know, we take a 20 dollar note out of our pocket and we immediately assume that this is twenty dollars worth uh, and I remember when I was a young very young person my younger than my daughter is now uh, I remember hearing from my dad my granddad my mom I don't remember whom something that really startled me that a twenty dollar note costs twenty cents to make but what so why is it twenty dollars then so you know a young mind finds it difficult to wrap it say, and the answer of course is that the actual value, exchange value, of a, a note or any kind of currency unit depends on the law and depends on our accepting that it has, believing that others believe, that we believe, that they believe, that we believe, that they believe that it is $20. Yeah? So there's a lot of believing, a lot of faith that goes into the creation of uh, the power and exchange value of money. And that is beautiful. Because, in a sense, uh, Marx had a very good ex uh, phrase by which to explain money. He said it's the alienated power of humanity. I love it. It's very poetic. The alienated power of humanity. That's money. It's been alienated from ourselves, alienated from my own, uh, our own thing. It's almost uh, subconscious, in a sense. Uh, now, take Bitcoin. People say, ah, it's not tangible, it doesn't exist, it's a digital figment of our imagination. Yeah, that is quite right. And I do not want to promote Bitcoin. I think it's a, it's a bubble and you know, don't buy them. But this is the wrong criticism that it is a figment of our imagination, that it's digital, that it's virtual. All money is virtual. If you look at the first uh, coins, nomismata, um, Archaeologists tell us that uh, they came in the form of shells in Mesopotamia on which the rulers or the agents of the rulers were writing numbers. So the peasants would be working on the land and it would take time for the harvest to come in, you know, six months. So they were being paid every week or every month or every day periodically by means of these shells and the numbers on them, this is how writing uh, emerged from a system of accounting uh, following the agricultural revolution of who owns what. So the numbers on the shells entitled the peasant to a quantity of wheat that has not been produced yet hmm? from the harvest that will come. So they were accumulating these shells and of course they could use them in the, to exchange them for thi for milk, let's say, because by passing on the shell to somebody else, they say, "Look, I am entitled to a bit of wheat in six months' time. You take this, and you're entitled to that wheat, and give me some milk now." So it's a kind of transferable credit, written on a shell. 
And what I found exceptionally fascinating when I first read it many decades ago, and I told my daughter, and she thought it was quite interesting too. Um, you know, the first metal coins did not exist. Got it? The first metal coins did not exist. They had created the smelting techniques for creating bars of iron and so on. Uh, uh, but it was difficult to ex at first to extract large quantities of iron, of pig iron initially. And something you, you may not know, this is I found out from my father who's a metallurgist, uh, iron, when it was first invented, discovered, discovered, not invented, the technique of creating iron, of extracting it from iron ore and smelting it and shaping it, was far more expensive than gold because it was rare at first. Then, of course, when they started producing a lot more of it, its price collapsed, compare, exchange value compared to, uh, to gold. But So the hegemons in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia ordered that large um, uh, quantities of iron be produced and shaped as large disks that, that would actually weigh tons. So, of course, they could not be moved. So the shells would now correspond to a percentage of that iron block, right? So, of course, you could never put it in your pocket. You could never carry it with you. So you had the shell, uh, the equivalent of having um, paper money. It was shell money, corresponding to the metal. But interestingly, th they realized something really smart. They didn't have to wait for the production of those iron blocks. They said, imagine that we have these iron blocks, and this shell gives you a, a percentage of that. And that's how the economies work. So this was totally, I mean, what's, what's so different to what we do today? Mm -hmm. huh? When you go to a bank to get a loan, you think that the banker gives you the, somebody else's money? No. We have this complete fiction in our minds that when the bank gives you $100,000 to buy a house, to buy a car, to invest in your restaurant, whatever, that the, the, the money the, the money is like a vault where people put their savings in, and because it's idle savings, the bank takes a chunk of that and gives it to you. No, that's not how it works. Do you know where the money comes from? Nowhere. <laughs> Thin air. It's virtual. So what happens is the loan is approved. The banker types 100,000, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in your bank account. You go to the ATM. It prints out 100,000. You think, oh, great, fantastic. And what do you do? You buy a car. So, you know, with web banking or you with wiring, whatever, those digits are transferred to somebody else's ledger. That's it. Virtual, just like in Mesopotamia, like in Bitcoin. And the only thing that gives the dollar its value is the belief that you have that it has value. And this is crucial here. And that doesn't apply to Bitcoin. This is why Bitcoin would never be a currency. The United States of America government commits to accept that currency to extinguish your taxes. The, no, the nomos part, the law part. The law and the belief. That's what creates the value of money. But, and he says, he, this is the aside, the important aside with which I close this answer. This gives enormous power to the bankers. Because anybody who has the right, the legal right, to conjure up money out of thin air controls your lives and your societies. And unless we control them democratically, they will blow up their own constructs and we will have to bail them out again and again and again. As we have and we have and we have. And, you know, when you hear about the system that is really based on nothing, it sounds so preposterous. Yeah. Uh, and having lived through, in this country, uh, the most recent Great Recession in 2008, and you see the, the crazy things, people who are allowed to buy houses who never should have been allowed to buy homes, and the madness of it all, I remember at the time thinking, well, this is just madness. This never should have happened, but at least we'll learn from our mistakes. Yeah, you see where I'm going with this one. Wh and well it will never happen learned, again. We have learned, but those who profited hugely during those pr profligate times um, profited also after they went bankrupt at your expense. So they learned that they should do it again. So how do we stop the madness? 
Well, before I answer that, let me just say just a couple of words. What was it that really changed? Why, why didn't the subprime market exist in the 1960s? I mean, what, the financiers hadn't thought of it? Suddenly they had a, an epiphany in the 1990s and 2000s that created the subprime market where they were actually, um, what we mean by the subprime market is, you know, they were, it was, it was predatory lending. They were finding people whom they knew would not be able to repay their mortgages and forcing them effectively, enticing them, putting a lot of pressure upon them to take the loan, knowing that it would not be repaid. Now, how do you explain that? Why did that never happen in the 1960s? And that will give us the answer that you are seeking. Uh, the reason is that by the 1990s, they had discovered a financial technique that had not existed before, and the law did not allow before the 1990s. And what is the technique? The technique is the, the so-called splicing and distributing technique. So when you had old boring banks like the ones we had in the 1950s and 60s under the New Deal regime, under the Bretton Woods system, okay, and that is of course the answer, what we need to go back to the New Deal, but I'll explain this a bit better in a minute. But when we had these restrictions on bankers, the bankers, when you went to seek a loan from them, were worried that you will not be able to repay it. So they scrutinized you. They looked at your business plan, they looked at your income flow, they looked at your credit ratings, and they were very coy, and they would only give you a loan if they thought they could get their money back. They would never give you a loan knowing you they wouldn't get their money back, because then they would have to be answerable to the Fed. Huh? Because that's the, on the only backstop is the Fed, this virtual money. It's the Fed, the state, the IRS, this is the backstop of the banking system. Without them, there is no banking system. There is no finance. So uh, all those who the neoliberals who, who imagine that you can have a, a, a beautiful capitalist world without a state, they're j either they're fooling themselves or fooling us. Uh, but what happened in the 1980s onwards, but then it accelerated in the 1990s and in the 2000s it went completely berserk, was this process whereby I would give you, I'm the rogue banker, huh? and they're all rogue bankers by that stage, uh, I would give you a mortgage and not give a damn about whether you pay me back. Why? Because within hundreds of a second of having given you the loan, I would take your loan, I would take a bond issued by the Greek government, I would take a US Treasury bill issued by the US Treasury Department, Oh, these are all forms of loans, all forms of debt. That's what it is. Let's not get complicated. Words like bond, this, that. It's debt. Take all of these people's debts. Some of these people, or institutions or governments, are more credit worthy than others. So the, the chances that the American state will default on a loan that has taken from you are tiny compared to somebody who is, you know, a blue collar worker in Tennessee. So what you do is you take a hundred uh, dollars of the loan that I've given you, well, take it away, you put it in a box, then take another hundred dollars that the US state has borrowed from me or from somebody else, put it in that box, uh, the Greek state, uh, Deutsche Bank. And you, you have, a, imagine a box where you've got piles of money in there, each pile owed by a different entity with different credit worthiness. And now imagine that you complicate this further and you also say that anybody who buys this box is going to get a 20% um, bonus if uh, on the 20th of January 2021 it rains in Tokyo. <laughs> but not if at the same time it, it rains in Rio de Janeiro. And you uh, uh, imagine that you, you then you, you use computers to introduce other such clauses and bonuses and, uh, and you create such a complicated box that even you who have created have no idea what its value is. And then you put it on sale. Why would anyone buy it? Because you are selling it as uh, an investment opportunity. Uh, a safe asset. Why? Because it doesn't depend on the credit worthiness of one person. If you took a loan from me, but only a hundred dollars of that loan are in there, lose your job and you can't repay, it's only a hundred dollars out of a box that contains millions or billions. Yeah? 
So it doesn't matter whether you default or not. But and if I have taken your loan and I've put it in a million different boxes, effectively you've disappeared. The risk that I faced from you not repaying has disappeared. And if I blend it cleverly with safer debt, suddenly I've created these forms of debt which I can sell to people who have who are cash rich and who want to in, you know who want to get more than what the bank gives them in terms of deposit interest rates. So I don't care whether you give me the money back because I do not own that loan anymore. It's been dispersed. People in China, in Germany, in Brazil have, you know, pension funds, city councils have purchased this in the, the, in, in the belief that they are investing in something tangible. You know? And then they made a lot of money doing this. But then they realized that those who had bought those boxes, by the way, those boxes are called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, because one thing financiers and economists understand is if, like, if you give a complicated name to something that people do not understand, then it increases your power over them. Yeah? So suddenly they realized that those um, um, victims that bought those boxes of them, of theirs, made a lot of money out of them because the value of those boxes was going up. So you know what they started doing? They started buying each other's boxes. And they made more money. And the more they bought, the higher the price of those boxes. And they realized, my God, we don't have to do traditional banking. We just produce more of those, those boxes and buy them. And then they used your money or they took out loans in order to buy other people's boxes. And then you end up with, a, with Deutsche Bank, for instance. Yeah? I'm using a European bank so that we don't always blame Wall Street. Do you know how much money they bet on this rubbish? I won't give you a number because it would make no, no meaningful sense to you. There are so many zeros. Okay. You know Germany is a rich country. Eh? It is a very rich country. Okay. Take total German income. Total German income. The whole income of all Germans. And multiply it by 50. This is the amount of money Deutsche Bank, one German bank, had bet on those boxes. And then, of course, you realize... I, that answers the question, so what happened in 2008? Why did they go bankrupt? These people were making all this money. How could those bankers who were swimming in it one day, suddenly they require this huge bailout from taxpayers the next day? That's your answer. So, in a few moments, we're going to move to questions from the audience. And before we do that, I want to end, because I hear about that, and I just get very depressed, and I don't want to end on a depressed but, Okay, note. you ask me, what do we do? We stop them from doing it. What FDR did in 1933 is he put the financial genie back in the bottle. He said, you know, if you do this, you know, I'll put you in prison. We ban it. We stop uh, the, the sale of these boxes. They are far more toxic than the sale of heroin. You know, deal in heroin. It's safer. <laughs> you know, d d just don't do it. Uh, under the Bretton Woods um, uh, Glass-Steagall Act in particular, you were not allowed, if you had a bank, to trade in these bets. It was really very simple. Who changed that? Larry Summers and Tim Geithner under Bill Clinton. And the whole thing blew up. And guess what happened when President Obama was elected in order to clean up the mess? Whom did he appoint to clean up the mess? Larry Summers and Tim Geithner. And what did they do? They bailed out their mates. And then we wonder why Donald Trump is the President of the United States. <laughs> I will let uh, audience members follow up with political questions because I have a feeling they will. I want to end sans politics, at least for my part of it, and go back to Xenia uh, and a boating trip that she took one night. Uh, and you used that experience to talk about the value of experience uh, compared to the value of exchange. And I think this is a really beautiful story. Uh, well, and thank you. And a nicer note like to at it, least actually. add on. So tell me about that. You see, people think, that we have been conditioned to think that if you give price incentives to people, they will do the same thing they were doing without price incentives, more of it, better, be more efficient, and more productive. Now, it is true if you're producing potatoes and the price of potatoes goes up, you'll probably produce more of them. This is the process of commodification and marketization. But what I wanted to explain to my daughter, and to my students actually, when I was uh, still teaching at university, is that 
we must not never extrapolate from the potato market to the rest of social life, social and economic life. There are many important contributions to society that people make every day that keep us, our communities alive, our lives happy, us away from antidepressants. That if you give a price to them and you increase that price, you will destroy it. And, she, and so my daughter was saying, so give me an example. I said, okay. And we happened to be that, that night, um, not actually, it, it was a couple of nights after the event that I described in the book. Uh, in the summer in Greece, and she's coming to Greece next month and I can't wait uh, because it's a fantastic opportunity for me to stop doing everything I do and we go on our island of Aegina and we have a small boat and we go swimming during the afternoon and then eventually end up uh, on a little cove where there's a taverna on the sand and we ditch the boat on the sand and we get off in a swimmers and we have dinner. And of course there are other boats there, there is a fisherman, Kostas, whom I mentioned in the book. So I remember, we, you know, I had, I had this memory. I remember one night, you know, these are long days and they're quite tiring, but beautiful and very great fun for family and friends. And I remember it was, uh, we were still in our swimmers, it was 10 at night, uh, she was tired, I was tired, but we, 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 you know, it was winding down the day, we, we, we were having dessert on the beach, and we were about to get on the boat to go back to the harbor where we had parked the, the car to go home. So I'm telling you all our family <laughs> routine now. And at that time, Costas, who was a, a local fisherman, an elderly man in his late 70s, who kept fishing because he loved doing it, and also he made some money out of it, um, comes to us and says to Xenia, because she, she was actually a very good swimmer and a very athletic and energetic child back then. Now she's, you know, three years, four years later, she's uh, a bit heavier like adolescents tend to be. Anyway, back then she was, you know, a, li a little hero, or heroine, I should say. And he said to her, look, Xenia, um, my anchor got stuck on the bottom of the sea. Not very deep, about, you know, some like yeah, 10 feet. Uh, will you help me get it out? He's an elderly man. And she jumped up, and she felt she was a hero. Um, so it, it was the middle of the night, it was the, the waters were dark, it, it was getting slightly cold, you know, she was, but she loved the idea of helping him. So he gave her a, a piece of rope, so she uh, dove in and threaded the anchor and he pulled the anchor out and she felt, you know, she couldn't stop telling her friends about it back in Australia. And I said to her, suppose that he had come to you and said, Xenia, um, or I had come, or somebody had come, I'll give you five dollars to do this. Would you do it? And the answer is absolutely not. The five dollars was not sufficient compensation for diving into the sea. A especially given that if you do it for, th for the money, you are not doing it for the love. You're not doing it as a community exercise. So it devalues it. And it, there is a lot of evidence of that. For instance, uh, if you compare countries where uh, blood donations, are paid for with countries where they are not paid for. In countries where they are not paid for, uh, the blood supply is much greater. People donate a lot more than if they are paid to donate. And especially there was this study that showed that in cantons in Switzerland where they switched from uh, a volunteer free donation system to one where the people were being paid, the actual, the, the, the donors started to stop being donors. And economists were bamboozled. Why would you stop doing something that you're doing anyway when you're being paid to do it? And the answer, of course, is that when you are going into the blood donor van that is visiting your village, you feel you know, there is a quasi-altruism uh, there and a quasi-selfishness. The quasi-altruism is because you feel good that you're donating and that makes you feel good. And also there's the quasi-egoism because yeah, people see you doing it, and you, your reputation inc improves in the village. But if there is a sign outside saying you will get $10 for it, that reputational impact upon you goes away. Suddenly, you are not, people will be seeing you doing it, and they will not think, ah, what a good person. They will think, ah, he's doing it for the money. 
and that takes away from the experiential value of donating. In universities, I experienced that. I remember when I was at the University of Sydney in Australia, um, some other professors and myself, out of interest, and because we enjoyed it, we would uh, give some additional tutorials late at night to interested students. It was not part of the curriculum. It was not necessary requirement. They didn't get any grades. We didn't get paid for it. Nobody knew about it, more or less. We just did it because it was fun. Yeah? And then we had the process of quantification and commodification, managerial process that comes from the university, and which ties your promotion, your salary, to quantities, measurable quantities. And you had to give a report every second month about everything you did. So you need to, uh, and, and you got brownie points depending on what that was. So you got certain brownie points for publishing an article, for giving a public lecture, uh, for um, giving additional classes. Do you know what, we, what happened? We stopped giving those lectures, these additional ones. Because when we wa walked into these uh, seminar rooms with our students before the quantification, it was clear to the students that we were doing it out of love, out of community, out of because we were interested, not love for them, but love for the subject, for the discussion, for the conversation, for the exchange. When it became common knowledge that it was all written down, that we had the process of commodification within the university, I could see the students thinking, ah, oh, he's doing it for the brownie points. And I was not doing it for the brownie points. I could get more brownie points by publishing an article instead of talking to them. So in the end, even though none of us said, okay, now we'll go on strike and we don't have, in the end, it died out. So public goods die when you in neglect the experiential value of things that we do as communities and you turn them into commodities and you commodify them and you start giving monetary payoffs for them. I'm not against men monetary pay payoffs. The point I was making to my daughter was, do not assume that attaching a price to something that, did that only had a value before is going to increase its supply and will improve our lives. In light of that, I will not give $5 <laughs> to anyone who would like to ask a question of Giannis. We've got microphones. Thank you so much for um, coming to speak to us tonight. Um, I have a question as a, uh, a very recent uh, graduate with an economics degree. Um, <laughs> Commiserations. Thank you. Um, and congratulations. Thank you. So I, I was pretty conscious when I was learning all of this uh, neoliberal economic theory that it, as, as you said, it's mostly fiction. Um, why do you think, in, in your experience as a professor of economics, um, that most economics professors who most likely, as you do, realize that it's fiction, perpetuate fiction to their students? Splendid question. <laughs> it's not a personal failing. It's an institutional failing. Hmm? Let me try to explain this. Take a professor of sociology, a professor of anthropology, and a professor of economics in any good university, hmm? Ivy League university in this country. The economist will make three times as much money as a soci sociologist. It's a fact. Yeah? It's a fact. The sociologists may make 60,000, 70,000. The economists will make 200,000 easily in an Ivy League university. Now, why is that? It is because economics has managed to portray itself as the science of society, with sociology being mm, something nice to have, like good manners in a military academy. <laughs> nice to have, but not necessary in the field of battle. <laughs> yeah? uh, and how is it that economists have perpetuated this um, myth that evolved. No, I'm not saying that there was never any conspiracy by economists to, you know, to do this. Of course, every, si every academic tries to increase his or her social power, discursive power, salary, everybody. Sociologists try to do it. 
The question is why did the sociologists fail to do it and the economists succeed in, succeeded in the doing? Well, because the economists portrayed themselves as the natural scientists of the economy, which is where all power lies. Power does not lie in society anymore, in the sphere of politics. It, who has more power? Um, the President of the United States or the CEO of Goldman Sachs? There's no doubt that the answer is the latter. Yeah? Uh, who has more power uh, in a university? The economist or the sociologist? The economist. And why does the economist have power? Because the economist has access to the financial engineers that I spoke of before, the ones who were creating those boxes it's called the collateralized debt obligations, who need, um, if you want a veneer of respectability, they like to have financial economists write articles saying that this kind of endeavor is creating uh, more efficiencies in the world economy. Uh, so when that gets published in the American Economic Review, in the Journal of Political Economy, uh, that gives, the, it plays the role that bishops used to play for the kings in the Middle Ages. Uh, they don't pull the trigger, but their sermon steadies the hand that pulls the trigger, if you know what I mean. So they get a lot of research funding from the banks, whereas a sociologist cannot get comparable sums. And they get research funding to produce articles that look scientific because that gives, you know, mathematics, as I was saying, has a great deal of um, discursive power over our minds and over society, and especially if it creates a monopoly because the wide public does not understand, cannot read those papers ever. So, so huh? now, take a young person like you, to see how th the process reproduces itself. You go into there, in, in, into an economics department, because you, you know, you, you're intrigued. You want to, to study those models. You want to study the economy. You say, well, I have to start with economics. How else would I, do I start? You encounter the microeconomic models, general equilibrium models. You realize that there is something really the matter here, because the models are beautiful, but they are irrelevant. And then, you know, four years later you have a degree, and you think, okay, what do I do now? There are two possibilities. One is to abandon all this and go and work somewhere and have a life. Or you can say, I will stay in, especially if you are, um, if you are talented and you get a grant, um, a scholarship to do a PhD, and you're fated by your profession because you're smart. But let's say that you're both smart and you have a conscience. And you walk in there and you say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to immerse myself into those models, but I will try to subvert this and, 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 and turn this science, science, pseudoscience, into something that is socially useful. But remember, in order to maintain your scholarship uh, and to graduate, you have to prove your mathematical theorems. The only way you, have to, you can prove your mathematical theorems is by introducing assumptions in your mathematics that make your theories absolutely irrelevant in the real world. And here's the clincher. Once you've been through 10 years of that, and there is a possibility of a career, either as the chief economist or sub-chief economist of one of these banks, or within academia, one of the Ivy League departments, it takes a monstrously heroic disposition for you to stand up in front of, peer, of your peers and say, this is all rubbish. Huh? after you've invested 10 years of your life in it. So may, some do, and some have an epiphany. Take Joe Stiglitz. Joe Stiglitz is a very good example. He's a fantastic man, a very sweet man, a very clever man, a, a brilliant economist. Allow me to make this point about Joe. You know, he has the Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> he would never be appointed associate professor anywhere on the basis of all the good things that he's done in life, let alone get the Nobel Prize or become a professor. He would never, I think he would be unemployed if all he had done were the good things that he has done since 1998. He got his professorship, his Nobel, for all the technical things that he did before 1998, the things that he has himself renounced. Huh? So all the things you know Joe Stiglitz for, would not be enough to give him a job beyond a, co a community college. Yeah? Now, what happened in 1998? He was appointed by Bill Clinton on the World Bank. 
And he believed in, in his economics because, you know, he'd gone through this process. He did not have the, uh, the politi politicization that is necessary to be critical, perhaps like you are. But in 1998, because he was a smart man and a decent man, he saw what the World Bank did in Southeast Asia and what the International Monetary Fund did, how they crushed whole populations hmm? and how they uh, completely brutally um, effectively sacrificed a whole generation of people uh, using the same models that he was helping develop as an excuse and ideological cover, the sermon that I was referring before. And he rebelled and he spoke out and guess what? He was dismissed from the World Bank. And then he became um, a renegade. The Nobel Prize he won for the things that he was doing before, not for the good things for whom, for which we know him. But how many people can do that? How many people can have the conscience and the honesty and also the epiphany <laughs> during a major crisis like the 1998 Southeast Asian crisis to do that? Very few. I have a question right here. Thank you very much. My name is Gary O'Connor. Uh, I think you can answer this in a couple of dozen words if you wish. Uh, but since you uh, uh, mentioned Stiglitz, uh, may I ask what you think of uh, the chap that did Barefoot Economics, uh, Max Van Neef, uh, is it? Uh, barefoot Economics, uh, he's um, a South American economist. and I have to confess I haven't read it. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. All right, okay. I'm sorry to have disappointed you. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it, so I'm not going to, uh, to, to put forward a position on the basis of complete ignorance. Question over here. Yep. Hi, Yanni. Uh, my name is Peter Demopoulos. Thank you for coming to Los Angeles. Um, three, uh, maybe three quick questions. Number one, <laughs> they're, they're going to be quick. The quick, Greeks. Quick. You have you yeah, not yeah, heard this that's man? The you, you get one. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll make it very simple then. Um, I'm joking, ask your question. <laughs> well, well, I've been meaning to ask you this one question. What would Yanni Varoufakis say to um, Yanni at the age of 21, if he was sitting in this audience, um, about how to look at life? Uh, number two, Hang on a second. What would a 21 year old no, no, sitting no. in this What would Yanni Varoufakis today yeah. say to a 21 year old Yanni in the audience All right. today? Yeah. And number two, uh, China. I mean, if you look at the world. Okay, we, we, know we are peripatetic. We move from one subject to another, that's fine. China, what about China? China? Uh, if you look at the world economy, this happens to be a nation or the Asian bloc that is trying to move the world forward economically. And it seems like the American empire won't let it, but it could, pay, it could play a very progressive role in changing the material well-being of the world. What's the third one? <laughs> <laughs> you promised me three questions. Um, <laughs> uh, so after this event tonight, can we go on and have a drink? <laughs> well, let me start from the third one. I wish I could. I have uh, my alarm clock is set for four in the morning, and I have hardly slept in the last few days. So I would turn you down. I would love to, but I'm going to Toronto very early in the morning. Okay. What about? And August then after that, I'm going to South Africa. Okay. What about August in Athens? <laughs> August is my, my daughter's month. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk afterwards, yeah? Now, the first two, two questions. I'll start with China. Well, the reason why the Great Recession in 2008 in this country did not turn into a Great Depression is twofold. One of the folds is the Federal Reserve that unlike in 1929 when it was sitting on its hands doing nothing in 2008, it printed money as if there's no tomorrow, uh, which it had to do. My criticism is what it did with it, not that it printed money. You have to print money during a crash, a financial sector crash. It gave it to the wrong people, but that's another question. And the second fold, the reason, second reason why you, America is not in the state of Greece today, why you are not in a Great Depression, is China. Because China rebalanced uh, and the, the, you know the global economy and helped the United States uh, recover or not implode. China in 2008 lost its net exports, a very significant chunk of its net exports. You know, Trump is going on about the trade surplus of China. It's very small now compared to what it was before 2008. 
So when you lose all these exports, mm, uh, your na national income shrinks, unless you find ways of replacing this chunk of national income. If the Chinese had allowed the, uh, their national income to shrink, they would have created a very nasty dynamic within China because China has to keep moving. It's like a shark. It has to keep moving in order to remain alive. It has to keep growing at 6 7% because there is the internal migration as well. It's a country on the move, especially back in 2008. Um, people from the mainland, the hinterland, were moving to the coastal areas. And to keep that process going, you need to have a, a, a China, to put it differently, in order to stay at what United States would be 0% growth, they had to have 6 to 7% growth. So they replaced that demand, local demand, local income that was lost, uh, lost through the exports to the West because of the West's great crisis by cranking up investment from a very high 38% rate of national income. So 38 cents out of every dollar earned before 2008 was being invested, huge investment rate. And it went up to 52. More than half of every dollar that the Chinese economy produced was being invested. And this investment stabilized Europe. And by stabilizing Europe and Germany in particular, it stabilized the United States as well. So the West owes a debt of gratitude to China for helping it rebalance the global economy. Uh, my great criticism of China is political. I cannot possibly condone a one-party state, the ruthlessness with which dissidents are being treated, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge that there is a boisterous local democracy uh, rising up in the uh, prefectures of China. As long as the authority of the Chinese Communist Party is not challenged, there are very interesting local, communitarian, democratic processes going on. We must not forget that. Uh, the reason why Trump is uh, now becoming so militant in his anti-Chinese rhetoric, which was there before. The Obama administration had the same kind of rhetoric. But the reason why Trump is uh, trumping up that <laughs> uh, process, in my estimation, allow me to say, is because he's acting on, he's talking about steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs, but n that's not really his concern. What his concern really is, is artificial intelligence and the digital giants that are growing up behind the firewall of China, creating serious competition for Amazon, for Google, and for Facebook. This is what it's all about. And it's about allowing Wall Street to go into China and do a wrecking job in the same way that they did in South Korea, in Thailand, in Malaysia in the 1990s, leading to the crisis in 1998 that led Joe Stiglitz to his epiphany. So um, to put it slightly more succinctly, American capitalism is not sustainable outside a recalibration of the equilibrium or disequilibrium, if you want, the balance between the three blocks, United States, China, and the European Union. We need, in other words, a new kind of Bretton Woods where there's going to be political coordination in order to bring up the levels of investment in Europe in large chunks of the United States, investment in things that's, that humanity needs, like green energy and so on, and to reduce investment in China because it's too much. But that can, markets cannot do this. We need adults in the room, to quote the title of my book, uh, representing these three blocks, and Trump is not one of them. You have oh, what, uh, and w also, what would uh, the advice be to a 21-year-old? No, I think I would not... Uh, um, violate the um, temporal uh, pr uh, prime uh, directive of Star Trek. <laughs> As Giannis mentioned, his alarm clock will be going off at 4 o'clock this morning. We want to be respectful of that and make sure that he has enough time to sign books, which he'll be doing uh, in just a few moments out there in the lobby. 
I wanted to just take a, a brief moment and say, as uh, Giannis had mentioned earlier when talking about blood banks, I found it fascinating that in the countries where people were not paid, that they actually gave more, which made me, of course, think about the place that we're sitting in right now. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of books at the libraries throughout Los Angeles that are available for free, which is really a remarkable thing. I think it's that diving off of the boat in the middle of the night for the sheer uh, joy of being helpful and the adventure of doing it. This offers something that Amazon and, and no other bookseller can. If you appreciate what you heard here tonight or other speakers that you've heard as part of the Allowed series, if you appreciate your library, uh, take some of that currency, which may be worth nothing in the end, the little shells that are written on, uh, and do what you can when you can to support uh, the Library Foundation, to which I'm very grateful for having myself and Giannis here this evening. He'll be out in the lobby signing books in just a few moments. Thank you all so much again, and thank you to Giannis. <laughs>